Uh, hello again, and uh, we are ready for the next part of the workshop. We will be discussing uh, impedance cameras. Uh, anyway, before, before we start, perhaps I can uh, give you some background about this uh, impedance camera. Uh, you'll be hearing more about it later on uh, uh, from uh, Dr. Crook and perhaps uh, Dr. Made. Uh, but uh, they were the original, I mean, uh, Dr. Made was the uh, original proponent of the uh, instrument because uh, the first version we did exactly for her, for, for her needs. And then I realized that this instrument uh, will be also useful uh, in another area. And this was uh, the sensors, particularly biosensors. Because uh, we are involved uh, in, in our company in developing some uh, tools for cancer therapies. And we wanted to make this uh, feedback loop uh, to adjust uh, uh, therapy parameters of our uh, instruments uh, by measuring uh, what is uh, response from the uh, immune system or from the uh, uh, patient's parameters. So an ideally would have this uh, great device that would apply it therapy, look in real time whether it is, this therapy is effective or not, and adjust its parameters. And we have this part, uh, this uh, therapeutic part, which has several parameters. However, we don't know how to adjust them because we don't know the state uh, of the uh, health of the, um, I mean, the molecular state of the uh, health of the patients. So uh, we are lacking this detection part. And I realized that this impedance camera would be a, a great tool to, to do just that. Uh, but we still need a sensor. And it turns out that electrochemical sensors are the most promising ones uh, because they are relatively simple to produce, so they are cheap, and uh, they can be very, very sensitive. However, the downside is that they are rather nonlinear, and the tools that are out there in the market, uh, they tend to uh, assume linearity of samples. So the camera turned out to be uh, something different that can actually uh, explore or take advantage of nonlinearities to, to have a very sensitive uh, detection of uh, substances in bodily fluids, for example. So this is uh, uh, why I, I am so uh, involved in impedance cameras. Uh, and perhaps we can, uh, we, we can start already uh, uh, this uh, presentation. All right. So uh, I need my uh, pointer, which is... Uh, yes, yes. As usual, it's hard to find. Uh, the impedance camera is a small device. It is just, just, just this piece over here. So it is uh, nothing like most of our instruments. Uh, it has small footprint, uh, but it's, it is still quite powerful. Um, the controlled parameters uh, are the voltage that, it, that can be applied to, to the sample from minus one to one volt, and it is continuous. Uh, there is a sampling rate of, uh, of this uh, input that also can be adjusted from uh, 10 megahertz to uh, one kilohertz. And this is uh, important because uh, if you go at full speed, at full rate, you will generate uh, 
40 megabytes of data per second. And it may clog your, not, not, not just your uh, PC, but your uh, uh, data analyzing capabilities. Okay, this is lots of data. However, because we have that many, uh, we can have that many points uh, of data, we can reduce noise. So we can have high detectivity of uh, even small changes in the signal. And the frequency range uh, is up to one megahertz. Uh, I mean, it, it can go down uh, way below, but I don't know if anybody has the patience to wait like weeks for one cycle of, uh, of measurement to finish. So this is, I mean, uh, one tenth of a millihertz. It's perhaps a reasonable thing to have at the, at the bottom, but if somebody needs uh, even lower uh, limit on, on, on this side, uh, we can, uh, adjust it for him. There is no hardware limitation, just perhaps user's patience. Uh, so again, I'm sorry. I, uh, what we would like to, uh, to use this camera for is to measure impedance spectra that are self-consistent. Because with ordinary methods, as you will learn in a couple of slides, uh, if the sample remembers its history, it has some hysteresis. Uh, by the way, uh, the yesterday example from, uh, from your sample, we know what, what was going on with it. Because we just, ha your sample remembers history. It has some hysteresis. So it, it might be like you have a, some ferro fluid there or something like this that actually is magnetized. I don't know if it is true or not, but uh, it, it certainly shows uh, hysteresis. So this, this is the explanation of this weird effect we had with the Calvin probe yesterday. So if the sample has this ability to, to remember uh, past history, I mean the history, uh, then uh, measuring one frequency of the impedance spectrum at the time will lead to systematic error, which is uh, a new the, uh, the spectrum will not be self-consistent. I will get back to that. And there are other uh, reasons why ordinary tools uh, are insufficient, and you will see that. So uh, you can use uh, impedance camera for two, type of, uh, two types of samples. One is uh, like the two contact sample and uh, impedance camera, will, what it will do for you. It will apply some input to the sample, and at the same time, it will measure the voltage across the sample and the current flowing through the sample. You need to remember that even if you know the voltage of the generator, it doesn't mean that uh, the voltage across the sample is the same. Okay, there, there, there are reasons uh, why there is this voltage measurement, independent voltage measurement. For example, your generator, when you have a, a small resistance here, can lower its voltage because it doesn't. It has some internal um, resistance, and because of that, you have res, uh, voltage drop somewhere else before it gets to the uh, to the sample. So the voltage drop on the sample may be different than the voltage. Uh, set by the generator. So this is important to measure it independently. And uh, this is also uh, the reason why we have so much data in, in the output signal. So you if you have 10 megahertz uh, sampling, that means, and each sample is uh, two bytes, so um, uh, you have uh, two channels to measure that make it 40 megabytes per second. And another uh, application, which is perhaps uh, even more interesting, it is when you have uh, electrochemical sample with electrolyte. So you use uh, three electrode uh, setup, which is uh, working electrode, which is close to your, uh, to your sample, uh, counter electrode, and uh, 
the reference electrode. Still, the measurement of those two channels is performed. However, uh, usually uh, the currents measured are way lower than, than in that case. Uh, and for, uh, for the measurement, the device is not that small anymore. I mean, the device is still the same, but it is attached to the sample chamber because you need to shield the, uh, the sample from the ambient uh, electromagnetic fields uh, and other things. So it, it gets bigger. Uh, and uh, still, it may look like uh, you have a potential stat here, but it is not a potential stat. There is no um, internal stabilization mechanism that would keep some voltage constant here. Although you can shift applied voltage up and down, uh, as the constant applied voltage up and down, uh, if you wish so. But uh, I am introducing uh, this impedance camera uh, without really explaining uh, what it really measures. Uh, so this, this impedance concept may not be that familiar to you. I will, I will uh, make it uh, perhaps easy to understand. And, but first, I need to, uh, to go to resistance. Uh, which is, uh, impedance is kind of uh, analog of uh, resistance for time varying uh, signals. And there are a couple of approaches to resistance. Uh, I, I will use uh, perhaps not the most uh, uh, orthodox way, uh, but uh, at least it will be uh, intuitive. So, uh, forget about uh, the measurement of voltage of the camera. Let's set up th this very simple system that has a generator. It will generate some voltage uh, varying in time. And there will be this uh, ampere meter attached. The red line denotes positive, uh, as usual, positive terminal of the, of the meter. And so there will be some current flowing in this closed circuit. So we suppose that this input here is given by the sinusoidal or cosinusoidal uh, uh, waveform. So this, in time, it just oscillates like that. And we get some output. And the resistance of the sample is easy to understand. Because uh, this is the amount of squeezing uh, of the output given constant amplitude of, this, uh, of, of the input. So this will keep constant, but we will be changing samples. And those samples will have different resistances. And the larger the resistance, this output will be squeezed more. Smaller resistance, it will be, it will be larger. So this is just squeezing. However, it is good for systems that, uh, I mean, for signals that are time independent. When you have time dependent signal like here, one more thing can happen to you. And uh, what is it? Uh, well, you can have the squeezing all right, but if the sample has the, the capability to store electric energy somehow and release it later on, it can shift the phase of the signal. I mean, it can store for a little bit the, the signal and then release it back to the circuit. And this uh, energy storing capability comes usually from either capacitance in the sample or some inductance, or perhaps there are other reasons for that. But the important part is that we can no, can no longer describe the output just by uh, talking about squeezing. There is one other effect, and this is a phase shift. I will switch back and forth, and you perhaps see this uh, blue line moving, OK? And this motion cannot be described by the resistance alone. You need another number. This is the phase shift of this, of this output signal. Well, 
since we have uh, the output, uh, how would we uh, measure the impedance? Because impedance is just resistance plus this phase shift. So you need two real numbers to describe uh, the, the effect. And well, uh, if our stimulus uh, was just this cosine uh, function of t with amplitude uh, of v omega, then the output will have this amplitude over here that is governed by the squeezing capabilities of our sample, by the, the resistance. And there will be also this phase shift here that is governed by energy storing capability of your sample. Well, it turns out uh, that uh, you can compute uh, this impedance. Uh, but first, uh, Impedance is time independent, all right, uh, here. It, you need to convert somehow your time dependent signals into this other space of frequencies or energies. Uh, and this is usually done by some Fourier transform or similar uh, transformations. Uh, and then when you are, uh, but still impedance is a very simple thing. So you have impedance for uh, frequency omega would be this amplitude divided by, by, by this amplitude. So this is the squeezing part. And there, it will be multiplied by, by the phase. This is a complex number. This is why you do it on computer. You don't get it directly from, from the measurement. You need to do some mathematical manipulation of the signal. However, you also have impedance for negative frequency because this cosine, uh, it, it says that it is uh, the function of this frequency, but in reality, it is the function of two frequencies, positive and negative frequency of the same absolute value, but positive and negative. So uh, there will be also uh, this negative uh, uh, part of impedance, which is, uh, it changes only, uh, the phase is changed here. The squeezing stays the same. And here are a couple of examples of impedances. If you have just a resistor, uh, the resistor doesn't have the energy storing capability. Of course, you can heat the resistor and it will give away its temperature, its heat somewhere, but it will not give back this electric energy into the circuit. It can dissipate some energy, but it does not store it. Uh, so the impedance is independent of the frequency of this stimulus, and it is just the resistance, okay? And most of the resistors behave uh, in their uh, range of working parameters like that. Like, like. This is a good, good uh, approximation. So even if you look for nonlinearities, it's hard to find there. Capacitor, better thing, because uh, this guy can store energy already. And it will do phase shifts depending on the frequency. So it depends on frequency. But uh, you see, this impedance is different for negative and positive frequencies. Because if you plug uh, minus <coughs> omega here, you'll have minus uh, omega here in, in the bottom. So this is different number. The same in magnitude, but different numbers still. Uh, and uh, more familiar example, perhaps, <coughs> for most of you, which is uh, a double layer. Uh, or uh, in electronic terms, uh, a parallel uh, RC uh, circuit. So this is a resistance and capacitance. So this, those two guys combined. The impedance uh, of that will, will look, uh, uh, is given here. So what you need to see, it is, uh, this is pure imaginary. This is pure real, but this has full complex number. 
And this complex numbering is, is a convenience. It is not uh, something that is uh, mystic or uh, that there, are, there is no metaphysics behind it. It is just a, a very convenient way of uh, then multiplying uh, voltages, impedances, and currents uh, without doing any geometry or keeping the phases. It is, it is very convenient tool to, uh, I mean, complex numbers to, to describe impedance. Uh, but nothing uh, uh, really secret about it. Uh, let's uh, if discuss more this double layer thing, how, how it works, uh, and what. Uh, uh, so you have, uh, suppose that you have some surface and there is uh, an electrolyte to the right and uh, some negative charge close to the surface, to the surface uh, in, the, in the bulk uh, of the material. And uh, so there are centers of, uh, uh, of the charges of negative and positive charges are separated a bit. And this constitutes a capacitor, because if they are separated, this is kind of capacitance there. This is why uh, it is uh, being uh, denoted by capacitance over here in this equivalent circuit. And there is also some resistance to the uh, current flowing through this uh, uh, layer, double layer. And this resistance is uh, uh, given here. So now we can imagine that we have this uh, generator down there that will be driving this, this circuit. And uh, we would like to see what would be the frequency response of this, uh, of this uh, little uh, circuit. I mean, of this, of this sample. Uh, and it turns out that uh, there are a couple of uh, parameters, related, uh, interrelated parameters, that you can describe your system uh, with. And it will be uh, a characteristic frequency that, that this uh, system can oscillate with. It is, given, it is given just by the parameters of the sample. It is not related to, to the measuring device to so this generator. No, the generator will just explore what this characteristic frequency is. And uh, by knowing that, you know the characteristic time scale in your, in your sample, and you may think whether the stimulus that we are applying to it, whatever stimulus, it is fast with respect to this time scale, or it is slow with respect to this time scale. Uh, and so this is uh, why you scan frequencies uh, and you look for uh, this characteristic uh, frequency. And it is uh, often the case with, uh, uh, with impedance spectroscopy. So this, uh, this characteristic angular frequency here is just, you see, it is given uh, by the parameters of the double layer. If you think that your double layer has just is characterized by, by this uh, capacitance and, uh, and the resistance, well, here you ha have it. If you find this, you find this uh, uh, product here. Uh, angular frequency is perhaps is not, uh, in, in, uh, for engineers, it's not the best uh, thing to Describe the system, you can go to, to the real frequency. This is radians per second, and this is just one over second, okay? Two pi uh, is the difference here in the denominator. Uh, and there is a, this characteristic time scale, which gives you seconds. So how fast, you will know how fast your uh, system will respond to the stimulus. All right, so let's see those impedance spectra. Wait. Since the uh, impedance is a complex number, because we 
put it into frame of complex numbers, then uh, we need to uh, decide whether we will be looking at real part and imaginary part, or we can look at the impedance in the polar, polar coordinates, which is the distance from the zero and the angle. This, I have chosen here the angle, but in our software you can do both. So let's see how this double layer, how it behaves. If we sweep our uh, frequencies from negative through zero to positive, or the other way around, you will get the amplitude, so this distance of this complex number from the origin uh, of, the, uh, of this complex plane, behaving like this. So it has some symmetry here. And at zero frequency, uh, it will be reaching this uh, resistance level, this R. So the sum, if you have it, you know what the resistance of your double layer is. And also, uh, you can look at phase, the second parameter. And this, this will be different on both sides. It will be anti-symmetric. The, so there will be symmetry around zero and uh, this point symmetry. Uh, and it will be different on, on that end and different on this end. Pi over two and minus pi over two. This is due to capacitance. And what information can you, can you get out of it? You know, the interesting part is happening around this characteristic frequency. Because this is where the change is uh, on, actually on both sides, because it will be uh, symmetric. But I, I was plotting it only on, on the positive side. Uh, first of all, the phase will change by half, by uh, this uh, pi over 4. And you can, uh, you can easily understand it. Uh, in a moment, I will, I will get back to this. Second, the, this amplitude uh, is changing uh, by what? Uh, it would be by uh, 1 over e, e being 2.71 uh, and, and so on. Uh, so this is based of a uh, natural logarithm. And uh, so if we are at characteristic frequency, uh, there will be a, a pi 4 uh, uh, phase shift. And why is that? Because the capacitor, capacitor here, can sh when you go from low frequency to very high frequency, it will shift the phase by uh, 2 pi. However, at this uh, characteristic frequency, you'll have current, the same amount of current going through the resistor as through the capacitor. For larger frequencies, you'll have more current going through the capacitor than through the resistor. And for lower frequencies, you'll have more current going through the resistor than through the capacitor. Basically, capacitor is a broken circuit for low frequencies, OK? This is why all the current will be at low frequencies will be going through the resistor. This is why uh, on this characteristic at 0, we, we are having just R. So we, we know this, uh, this piece of, uh, uh, of those two numbers that are usually multiplied uh, to the time scale, so RC. So we have R at low frequencies. Uh, However, at high frequencies, this is the short circuit. So it has zero impedance or zero resistance. Why? Because the uh, frequency is in the denominator of the, uh, of the impedance. So the larger the frequency, the lower the resistance, lower the impedance. So everything will be flowing through the capacitor, but there will be phase shift involved. The phase shift will be 2 pi at most. This is why uh, this picture is so informative. Because 
you can do your impedance spectroscopy, and you see that you have passed some point, and you reach the minus pi, OK? Min minus pi over 2, sorry. Minus pi over 2. This means that you had one frequency, I mean, one capacitance in your system. If you had two capacitances somehow, this phase will shift even more. It will go to minus pi at large frequencies, and so on. So you can count the, uh, how many capacitors you have in your, uh, in your circuit. Okay? All right. Uh, and it is all good for linear systems, because uh, for linear system, you apply the voltage, you read out some current, you divide one by the other, and you get always the same number, because they are linear. It is uh, unfortunately uh, not the case for the samples that we are after. And why our samples uh, do not need to be uh, linear? Uh, why they are not linear in, uh, in practice. One thing is because they have a capacitance. That doesn't make them nonlinear yet. However, when this capacitance changes with uh, applied stimulus, it depends on the voltage that you apply to it, that makes it nonlinear. Okay? Capacitor itself is perfect linear uh, element in your, in your uh, sample. However, it, it's rarely the case with electrochemistry because it depends on, on the voltage applied. Even a resistance does not need to be linear uh, in semiconductors. When you inject more carriers, you would expect that the uh, resistance will drop. So it will depend on the voltage applied again. Whenever you have interfaces with semiconductors, as we discussed yesterday, uh, there may be this effect of different resistance when current is flowing in one direction than when it flows in the other uh, direction. No linear effect. Or there will be uh, things like this uh, harmonics generating, uh, higher harmonics generation. Perhaps we'll hear about this uh, uh, in today's talk. Uh, yeah, we will, we will certainly. Um, and they might be even uh, those extra frequencies that are sums and differences of the basic frequencies applied to the system. And this will be the case for uh, impedance camera. So, and my favorite formula throughout this conference, this is uh, again uh, Landauer's picture. The current depends on voltage in a nonlinear fashion. Why is that? This is the current for electrons, so the sign is different than normal current. But when you apply voltage, you can imagine that as shifting one Fermi uh, distribution on one end of your sample, say up, and on the other end, perhaps down. And so you have this driving for, uh, thing for a current, but this, this function is not uh, a linear function of, uh, of V. Not only that, there is density of state that is coming here, which does not to, I mean, it has some dependence on energies. And this shifting explores these different parts of density of state. So in general, this integral is nonlinear. So you may apply some voltage and get current that, is, that isn't really linear. But mm, let's go to this, uh, to understanding how the measuring method works in, in impedance spectroscopy. Uh, so what you do, you decide the range of frequencies that you want to explore. So you're going to apply them to your sample. And uh, how you do this? You start with one frequency, then you go to the next, to the next, to the next, until you finish. And when your sample has changed or re remembers its history, before you end, 
the sample has changed from the beginning. So you're measuring one system here, another system, a little bit different system here, different system here, and so on. So when you have, of course, one 2D plot for the uh, spectrum, but it is hard to interpret because initial points might be applied to a uh, different sample than the final points. But uh, in reality, it is like this, that you apply this, uh, you think that you are applying uh, one frequency, but those are really two frequencies. When you apply cosine or sine, and those are the only signals you can do in reality. The, you need to apply real valued voltage or real valued uh, current, whatever your stimulus is. So you need to use those cosines and sines. But, but that means that you apply both frequencies at the same time. So this is your first step, this is your second step, and so on until you reach the, the final step. Uh, that has uh, this uh, property that uh, you need time to sweep through all uh, frequencies. And again, if your sample does change in time, it, it may not be the thing that you are after to extend this uh, measurement time. On the other hand, there is this uh, also used in, uh, in uh, impedance spectroscopy, the method called multi-sign. There are other names that I never cared to learn, really. But uh, the idea is pretty straightforward. And so you compose your input out of all frequencies at the same time, and you apply it uh, to the sample. Still, there is this uh, thing that when you apply positive frequencies, you also apply negative frequencies. There is no way around it. But uh, what you get in return is that your sample may have changed during the measurement, but it changed for all frequencies the same. So this is why uh, I call this uh, impedance spectrum acquired this way as self-consistent, because each point on the spectrum will be corresponding to the same sample, even if it's changed in time. And the, the measuring, measuring time uh, is shorter. You don't have to go after n frequencies each at the time. You apply them all together, so you have speed up of factor n. Well, there is a downside to this approach. Uh, the most important is that you have different frequencies in your signal. And when you have different frequencies and your sample is nonlinear, what will happen? You will have uh, intermediate frequencies generated. You will have higher harmonics. Now, uh, higher harmonics you can have on just for one uh, frequency as well, but they will certainly show there. And yeah, somehow you need to open your mind for, for nonlinearities. And uh, it is not an easy step to make mentally. Uh, however, with impedance camera, you can do both modes of operation. You can apply one frequency at the time and see the output or composed output of, of this application. And you can then do the same uh, measurement, but with uh, applying all frequencies at the same time. And you can compare the results. So going a uh, little bit further, the output, now let's say that we have started to measuring this voltage. Uh, it can be current, but the output isn't that simple, single sine wave, eventually shifted by, by some phase. It is, it is all the uh, richness of your input uh, somehow reflected in the output. And you need to analyze that. So uh, there is not only a pressure on you to to think about nonlinearities, but also on the software to, to cope uh, with this data somehow and uh, output the meaningful uh, analysis of that. I mean, 
output in the form of uh, impedance spectrum. Uh, again, what we are uh, acquiring from the hardware is this time series. Yeah, I mean, this time function, uh, function of time. Uh, whether it is uh, for voltage or current, they are all functions of time. And we know that to measure impedances already, we need to transform somehow to this frequency domain. And the usual approach is, OK, it's easy to do. We know it for over 200 years. Let's apply Fourier analysis to the signal. Uh, in, uh, for discrete sig signals, this Fourier transform is called FFT, Fourier, uh, fast Fourier transform. This, so this is fast algorithm. You, have, you can have uh, a load of data being transformed at the same time. Uh, but it is a no-go in our case. Why is that? Uh, with impedance camera and with other instruments that use multi-sign uh, approach, you can design the input signal. So you can tell, OK, I would like to have this frequency, that frequency, and that one in the signal. OK? So you know the frequencies that are entering the, the sample. You may not know the frequencies that, are, that you are getting out of the sample, but you know what you input. However, what the fast Fourier transform does? It says, I don't care what frequencies are there. I will assume that if the signal was that long from 0 to, to t, then I will invent my own set of frequencies, and they will be all equidistant. And the prescription for finding those frequencies is that the, the first, I mean, this step between uh, consecutive frequencies is given by this length of the signal, OK? And then the last frequency, it will be just, if you have n points measured, this capital N is number of points measured, discrete points, then it will give you n over half. This will be this Nyquist frequency. The, and so you will have equidistance frequencies between W n2 and W minus n2. You can find those Ws from, from this formula. So it is dependent on the length of the signal, total time span of the signal. And you may suspect already that this is not the greatest thing you can do. First of all, you knew already the frequencies that you, that you enter, so you don't have to assume some other frequencies. Second thing is that, well, this is a systematic error. You are introduced at the very beginning of your analysis, you introduce a systematic error into your uh, data because you think that signal was composed of those frequencies. Okay? And then you find out just what amplitudes would best fit the data if you apply those frequencies. So this is somewhat different issue. So you are doing perhaps things that you are not supposed to do. And uh, in impedance camera, we avoid this uh, uh, problem. And how we do this? We don't use Fourier transform, I mean fast Fourier transform. Uh, well, this is our output as it was before. And it has a span from 0 to to t, this uh, capital T. So this is our time period of measuring. Uh, and uh, we compute first uh, two numbers. This is called in-phase uh, component and quadru quadrature component in electronics uh, or in signal analysis. Uh, and we compute them for both uh, voltage and current, but here we are only considering voltage because it's all the same for, for current. So nothing can change. So we can discuss only, only voltages here. And how they are computed? All right. So we take this signal that we have acquired, and we integrate it with, with the cosine. 
Well, the second part, same signal, but we integrate it with sine. Those are two orthogonal functions. If you, that means that if you compute integral of cosine times sine, this is zero for, for uh, appropriate uh, period here. I, you may notice that this uh, t is not, it's not the same, as, does not need to be the same as this t. Uh, I will get to that uh, in a minute. However, when we have those two uh, quantities computed, we can go and find out what would be the amplitude of each frequency in the signal. And this is, so this is this V omega. For each omega, we can do this computation and we can compute uh, the amplitude. The amplitude is here. It is, uh, so those computed uh, uh, in phase and uh, quadrature components will give you a simple uh, uh, result, uh, this amplitude. You do the same for current. You'll have it. Uh, so this is the subscript I means that we computed them for a signal uh, from uh, the camera taken in the current column. And then you are ready to, uh, to show the impedance. So you'll divide this one by, by that one, I mean modulus, and you use uh, some phases of those the phases also are easy to compute, uh, be just believe me. Uh, but I don't show them here. So, uh, with this approach, we are uh, not making at least this uh, systematic error at the beginning, that because we know what frequencies we have included into input signal, we know what they, they should survive through the output. However, it is not only uh, those that we will be getting out if the sample is nonlinear. We may have uh, intermodulation frequencies uh, and those would be if omega 1, omega 2, omega 3 were the initial frequencies in our signal, then those frequencies will also be showing up, which are uh, uh, integer, uh, those k's, l's, and m's are integers, can be positive, can be negative. Uh, so this intermodulation will happen. And of course, higher harmonics generation will happen. However, when you acquire the signal uh, with our methods, you may think of, uh, of this tool in the following way. I will be looking only at, at this frequency, okay? Or if I'm interested in some intermodulated frequency, that might be uh, to your advantage. I can look only at that frequency and I will compute those integrals, those uh, x, y components for this frequency. It does not need to be in the signal, but I can still look through it. And this is like a channel. You are listening to a channel, okay? You, you are applying some frequencies, but you can choose uh, with impedance camera to what channel you are listening to because there might be something interesting happening. But it may be, you may be detecting uh, from your sensor the signal that is showing up, that, that is causing nonlinearity. And it is showing up at the, at the frequency that is different from those included in the input. Okay. Uh, I would like to uh, make some remarks on this uh, uh, integral uh, limit. I mean, for how long we, uh, we will integrate the signal. And uh, there are two approaches also applied in the impedance camera. One is that um, you, uh, I mean, to, to, to for those integrals to give sensible results, they need to span over uh, integer number of p 
peri periods included in the input signal. Meaning that if you have uh, frequency in the signal, uh, frequency omega, uh, then uh, this is a characteristic uh, time period for, for this frequency. And you multiply by some maximum number, integer number, but it still needs to be lower than, than the t, the total span of the signal. So this is uh, one way of choosing t prime. Another is a little different. We don't want to, we want to choose the frequencies only from the grid that fully uh, explores this uh, time period from 0 to t. OK, so we are saying it is not really important for us what frequencies exactly we apply. We just want to use all these sampling points. And we just adjust those frequencies so they fit. I mean, their uh, integer multiples of periods fit exactly in the 0 t uh, time. Two approaches, uh, they are all available. And what we get at the end? At the end, uh, we get the impedance spectrum. This is for the, uh, for the amplitude uh, of, of, of the impedance. So distance from the origin of this complex plane. And I, I'm showing here only positive frequencies. Because negative frequencies, they are kind of similar uh, for, for, for this impedance. And this is the uh, usual convention in uh, presenting uh, impedance spectra. They are concerned only with positive frequencies. Though negative frequencies are there. Make no mistakes about it. And the nice thing is that this spectrum is self-consistent. So those points, I mean, this is the distribution of uh, the frequencies here is taken logarithmic. It can be also equidistant frequencies. You can choose it from the software. Uh, somehow, logarithmic uh, distancing from uh, one frequency to another makes sense uh, in, in this type of measurements. Why? It is. You can, you can think of the uh, in acoustics, when you have a uh, frequency of sound, you know that in piano you'll have C sharp, C, middle, or whatever C. They are multiple of two uh, in frequencies. So if you had equidistant frequencies, you won't be kind of in commensurate with this, with, with octaves. However, if you do multiple or logarithmic scale uh, in sampling those, uh, those sounds, then it makes more sense. Similar thing with, uh, uh, with impedance. Usually you, you are after logarithmic scales. Um, okay, but this is just uh, the, uh, this was just the amplitude. You can also see the phase. It will be. It, it can tell you those stories. How many capacitors I do have in my system? Okay, if my frequency was large enough, I can count them. Uh, there are also other uh, plots that you can formulate out of those numbers. Uh, for those of you who are familiar with impedance spectroscopy, you may be familiar also with x and y long. Uh, you don't combine them into uh, this amplitude and phase, you just look at them uh, uh, in row form. You can have Bode plots and Nyquist plots or Argand plots as they are supposed to be called correctly in that, uh, uh, in that area. But what, the, what camera does is uh, it does one more thing. You can acquire one uh, impedance spectrum, we call it frame, not surprisingly. Then you can apply the same sig input signal again and again and again and in time and do the, those multiple measurements. And those measurements uh, are all uh, produced here. So you'll see this is time-resolved impedance spectroscopy. Uh, you can see different spectra 
I mean, at different time uh, points. And this is how camera was used by, uh, by Dr. Madei. So uh, they will be talking about this today. Uh, however, the nice thing here is, again, it is hard to overemphasize that those points are meaningful. They are measured on the same sample within the frame. The next frame, the sample may be a little bit different, but they are still self-consistent. They are measured on the same sample. Okay? And this won't be the case if you uh, have sample that remembers history or this fast changing, and you do one by one frequency uh, sweep. Of course, you can do the same uh, with the face and have this recorded uh, in time and see those nice uh, plots. Uh, there is time, oh, is it? There is time in that direction, so you have those necklaces of, uh, this is Nyquist plot actually. Uh, Nyquist plots are great because you can see characteristic frequency just by looking at the, uh, at the minimum of, the, uh, of this necklace, okay? So you can, you can see them through the time. And perhaps they have changed. And uh, this is really uh, uh, what I try to, to convince people of, that uh, to use this uh, device for sensors. Because uh, suppose that uh, you have some solution uh, and electrochemical sensor and that looks like that. I mean, looks, uh, it, it will develop in time once it detects some uh, agent from the, from the solution. It can be particular uh, protein or, or other agent. And you may see in time that, okay, something is changing. Uh, and because of that, perhaps we can devise much smaller and much cheaper device just for that particular application that can be used uh, at home without any laboratory or service people or great doctors uh, to, to do analytics. And if that would happen, then uh, we can have this feedback in, uh, with the uh, therapeutic devices. So the patient at home can uh, have not only the, uh, something that is trying to cure him, but also this, this something will adapt to the current condition of the patient, which is uh, in, in current uh, medicine, how, how does it work? There is also this, uh, this uh, feedback loop. So you are sick, you go to a doctor, and he will look at you and tell you, take that and that. You go back, take that, that and that, or don't, and uh, your condition doesn't improve, or something else happens to you. You go back to the doctor, and he says, okay, now take this and this. And uh, so there is the feedback. In, uh, in case of the uh, cancer patients, it is way worse because uh, they don't have time for, for this kind of play. So it would be great if we provided them with a therapy that would adjust within hours, not within, from one visit uh, to the other or from one NMR scan or uh, MRI to the next. Okay? Uh, this way, we may have a chance of, you know, using that time properly that they have and perhaps save them. And this is uh, what application of the camera I, uh, I'm struggling to, uh, to advertise. Uh, but uh, with the camera, uh, we really look into, uh, into those uh, non-linearities because this is what you experience in real world. And if you wanted to have such a feedback, uh, this is the way to go, perhaps. 
and really, uh, uh, this is uh, what it says on this uh, transparency that uh, we really want to explore non artists not to pretend they are not there. Okay, so uh, this is one thing. And another uh, closing remark uh, would be that we will show you uh, some experiment, perhaps uh, how this sensing may look like. Uh, can we switch to? All right, all right. So uh, here we'll be running one of experiments. This is very. Uh, this is a toy experiment. It is nothing real here. However, we will be uh, using this uh, uh, three point. I mean, three uh, contact uh, version of the camera, and we have our sample inside here. And we'll be uh, illuminating the sample with the uh, with the LED uh, revolver, with the LED revolver here, um, in periodic fashion. And we'll and this illumination is pretty weak. So what we will be uh, doing now will do measurement of uh, the impedance of the sample, and we'll see uh, how it develops in time, uh, how the spectra develop in time. So this is uh, you may see. Each uh, necklace is at different times. And uh, the most current is in the front. So those are added every time. So we do uh, this self-consistent impedance spectra every second here. And we see that something is going on there. Something is going on with the sample. OK? And uh, actually, this is. Uh, we, we made it periodic, uh, but some frequencies will be more pronounced than, than the others. And uh, can we rotate it to the, to the other side, to, to the side of frequencies? So uh, this frequency is uh, 1 kilohertz, and this frequency is 10 kilohertz. So you see that at 10 kilohertz, this amplitude is not that great. At lower uh, frequencies, the amplitude, is, the signal is, is getting stronger from this uh, stimulus that, in this case, is some modulated light. Uh, all right. Uh, ho I mean, you can, you can check the, uh, the differences, uh, not just the values for the impedance. Uh, can we do this? Oh, it's, uh, it, was, it was differences. OK, this is, uh, uh, sorry, but I, I made a small mistake, though. Uh, this is the real signal. What we've seen there was just differences. We were uh, uh, increasing, um, we were extending just differences, because this, is, this change is very uh, subtle uh, on the full value picture. But if you look at differences, it is much more pronounced. And this way, you can uh, uh, detect small changes in this impedance. <laughs> but only if you don't do stupid uh, systematic errors. Because if you do them, you will not be seeing anything like that. It, you, it, the signal may be easily lost because of uh, the wrong tool that you are using to the, for the detection. And we hope that we are we are cautious enough to design this camera and its software so you can find the find this, even faint signals you can you can find uh, in the output. Okay, um, I would like to uh, to stop uh, talking about camera right now, and uh, I will give the floor to uh, Mrs. Uh, Anna Jurczyk, who will show you. Some other device, the largest device we ever produced uh, in for for CDR products, uh, and this would be a photovoltaic uh, spectrometer. It will be a short talk, so you may enjoy it. So please.